Uh, okay, let me just give you an introduction and then we start. Okay, so if you remember, we started talking about the set theory and I told you that this is actually the foundation of all mathematics. Everything will be built on that in mathematics, in more advanced mathematics. Even numbers are sets. So when you want to define numbers from an abstract point of view, you define them as a set, for example, okay? But of course, we are not going into those topics, but uh, these kinds of examples might be missing in your book, but this is not beyond what you understand. So I just wanted to mention these examples to understand that sometimes the, the very simple notion of belonging to might be a little bit confusing, especially when we learn the next concept, which is called the subset. And if you have those concepts together, might be it would be a little bit confusing to organize your thoughts about very simple statements, true or false, yes? So because the, the relation of being a member of a set was very, very trivial in the beginning. I just want to tell you, still, still it's trivial, not hard, but I just want you to understand that. For example, the people who have worked with programming languages, usually, of course, uh, in programming languages, you have arrays or lists. Okay, but might be, depending on the language that you're working, there would be a different, a main different probably between a list and a set. What is that probably? Do you know? In most programming languages, if I know, in a list you can repeat an element in a list, yes? But in the set theory, do you remember, we talked about that we don't have repetition in a set. The set consisting of two ones and one two is exactly the same as the set of consisting one one and one two. So repetition in set is not allowed. Okay, but in, even in the programming languages, you have uh, lists whose elements are also lists. Yes. So these kinds of things are actually important. This is also the same in set. In a set, here we face a set. The first element is actually a letter, but the second element is a set. By the way, in set theory, if you want to understand this from a very abstract point of view, everything is a set, yes? So there is nothing except sets. So when, every, you, when you want to build up something, you have to construct everything. So this is not a good idea. If you are starting set theory, even this is a set. But this is a set containing a set, yes? But of course, forget about those things. So a good indication for you as a set is having these curly brackets around. Yes. So here, first of all, let me ask you, do you remember the fancy word of cardinality? So what is the cardinality? Yeah, just say it. Yeah. What's cardinality? The number, yes. Yeah, the number of elements. In the set. In the so for example, can you tell me what's the cardinality of this set here? Why you doubt? <laughs> yeah, what you want to say is correct. <laughs> what it's is that? Three, it's right? three, yes. So one element is A itself. The second element is curly bracket A, and the third element is curly brackets, curly brackets B. So the cardinality of this set is A. Is there any problems here? Do you understand the cardinality is 3? So I have two commas separating three objects. So these three objects are elements of this set. So this set is called a finite set because we can't count probably the number of elements inside. And that number is called the cardinality of this set. So the cardinality of this set, so let me write with different colors. So I'm just reviewing material. So if I want to show that the cardinality of this set is three, I use these symbols, which is very similar to the absolute value. And then I would write three in front, yes? Okay, now let us see which one is true, which one is false. It's, it's very simple, yes? Yeah? So if you want to imagine a set, imagine it as a big bag. Inside the bag, if you see an object like that, which is mentioned here, you say it's true, otherwise it is false, yes? So if, it, if I open this bigger bag, I see something inside it, which is A, and this curly brackets A, and this object. So is this true or false? True. Because, is, is it true because of the first A or because of the second A? Because of the second A. So this is true. So what about this? <coughs> true or false? false? True or false? false. Yeah, definitely false. Yes, don't get uh, confused. So if you say this is true, it means that you are claiming that. If you look inside, so let me write it. If I ask you, you said the cardinality is three. If I ask you name them, one of them is 
A. The other one is curly brackets A. And the other one is curly brackets, curly brackets, B, curly brackets, curly brackets. Okay. Is this object exactly one of those things that you see on that list? Exactly. The answer is no, so this is false. Yeah, is that understandable? So this is false. And I hope that you understand what is going on. True or false? This is claiming that A does not belong to A. It's false because A belongs to A, yes? Because of this A, yes? That's also false. What about the last one? True or false? True, yes? That's true. Let's go to the other one. Okay, let me ask you again. What is the cardinality of this set, B? Anyone else? Yes, please. Your name? Nabila. Nabila. Okay, what? Four. Yes. One, two, three, and four. So these are the objects inside. So this cardinality, of course, this is not included in the question, but if I want, I would write the cardinality of this four, is four. Is this a finite set or an infinite set, Nabila, yourself? It's a finite, it's a finite set, yes, because you can count the number of elements there. Okay, let us just try to do it together. Okay, you can just, everyone can shout it. You don't need to raise your hands. So two belongs to B. True or false? True. True. Because of the first one or the second one? The first one. Because of the first one. What about the second one? True. That's also true because of the second one. Six belongs to B. False. It's false. Is that understandable for everyone? If that's understandable, let us just skip that, explaining that. Number four. False. Again, false, yes? So number four is also false. Number six. Uh, number five. False. It's also false. Number six. False. It's also... It's true. true. It's true. This one is true because it's claiming that this package as a whole does not belong to B and that's correct. Because the only things that you see in B are just two alone and curly brackets two alone. I do not have this package as a whole in B and it is claiming the truth. Yes, so it is true. Any questions regarding this item? Yes? What if it said that the set 2 and the set of 2 belongs to B? That is true. Can you write it like that? Uh, that you only mention two elements. So may you repeat? You, uh, this question only mentioned two elements, two and the set of two. Yes. Can you write it like that and say that it belongs to B and the question is still true? This you mean? Yeah, and you say it belongs to B. Yes. It's true, is it? No. no. Now, by the way, these are negations of each other. They cannot simultaneously be true. If one of them is true, what you have written here exactly in, in logic, we call it negation. So this is a statement. It's, statement in mathematics is a declarative sentence, which is either true or false, but not both. Okay. So when I say a statement, this is declaring something to you. It's declaring that this object belongs to be full stop. So that's a declarative sentence. Yeah. Yes? So it is either true or false. And whatever it is, this is negating this one. This is telling you that this object does not belong to be full stop. So that's also a declarative sentence, which is the negation of this one. If a, if a statement is true or false, its negation should definitely be the opposite. Okay? And then why, why do you doubt that this should also be true? Yes, you, because you doubt that this should also be true somehow. No, I, I was just asking because the other way there. Yeah, yeah, we haven't I reached that. Yes, if you have actually uh, read a little bit ahead, that would be a little bit confusion. So that's what I'm saying. Please try to understand this concept because immediately after that, we have the notion of subset. Okay, and in the notion of subset, if you don't get, uh, if you don't understand what's going on, you might get confused, but you are right. In the future, we'll see that this would be a subset of B, but it does not belong to B. Yes. If that's the word that you're looking for, yes, you are right. But not belonging to. Yes? Would I answer your question? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, four belongs to B. True or false? False. False. So, as soon as you just see a four here, don't doubt. This is a still false, yes? And five does not belong to B. True or false? True. It's true. It's claiming something true. Yes? Is that understandable? Yes, it's very simple. It becomes a little bit confusing after I start teaching you the notion of subset. Yes, so be careful. Do not confuse them with each other. Yes. Uh, so on the question number six, so the same question as Nabila, but if you took away the parentheses at the beginning, no. 
Okay, let us answer this question now. Let us, uh, this is good, you yourself, other students answer. So what you, Amanda is saying, is that right, your name? Yes? yes. Okay, so if you, you are, you are telling something like that, what do you think about this? Is it true or false? Yes? I mean, if you would write two and then, well, and the set containing two belongs to be, that would be true. But I don't know the comma, does that mean and? Exactly. So actually he answered. So this is not one single statement. If you write it in this way, you are claiming two things. Yes, usually, and he answered very, very nicely. Thank you. So it means that, do you interpret this comma then as and? So it means that I am claiming two things. I am claiming two belongs to B, full stop, and curly brackets two belongs to B. Okay? And this is called conjunction. So when you say you have a statement P, conjunction means and Q. Okay, when do you think? Because a statement is either true or false. Yes, so this statement is either true or false. This statement is either true or false. But if... When do you think that's a good reasonable way? This is the logic behind our head. Okay, when do you think P and Q will be true? And when do you think it will be false? For example, if I say that Stockholm is the capital of Sweden and New York is, cap is the capital of US. How do you evaluate? Is it true or false? Oh, oh Washington, sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. But true or false? Washington, yes. But both statements has to be true. Has to be true. Right Even if one of them is false, then the whole thing would be false. Mm -hmm. Yes? Because you said exactly, I made a mistake and you had detected correctly. So New York was not, even though Stockholm was a, the capital of Sweden, because New York was not the capital of the US, so it was false. Everybody understand that. If one part of it was true, one part of it, but when I write it as and, you expect that the whole package should be true, yes? And it was not the case. Okay. So, so these, this is called mathematical logic. I will not go through it because in principle, you should a little bit study mathematical logic first and then start set theory because whatever we construct on set theory is based on logic, not mathematical logic. The logic that humans, I don't know, our brains or whatever has been evoluted in this way that actually we understand something. something. If I tell you that, uh, yeah, so you see, you, you could evaluate my sentence to be false, the first sentence that I made mistake without I teaching you something so that's the logic that you're actually obeying that automatically and that's the same logic that you use to code the programs yes so this logic is probably working at actually for our world probably yes okay so um, so I hope that we were able to answer your question Amanda yes so this is not one statement that's two statements and then, if we are consider these two statements as this, what do you say? What, how do you evaluate it now? It's true because both of them are true in this case, yes? 2 belongs to B, curly brackets 2 also belongs to B. So if I consider this statement as a short way of writing 2 belongs to B and curly brackets belong to B, then this statement is true, yes? Okay. Uh, now let us go to this question. Usually writing these things in English should, might be a little bit difficult. I hope that this is not very ambiguous or vague for you when you read it. So in which of the following sets, after you understood what I mean, if you think that I can change the sentence in a better way, please help me to do that, okay? But what I mean is this, in which of the following sets, if any, there is no guarantee that one of them satisfies this condition that I'm looking for. So in which of the following sets, if any, for every pair of distinct elements of the set, one set in the pair is an element of the other. So I don't know how should I... <laughs> so I might be this is... But I think it is understandable. It's understandable for me because I actually express that. <laughs> might be you are understanding in a different way. But let us see that if we can come to an agreement after you understood what I said. Is any one of you have a comment on that? Or how, how do you interpret this sentence? <laughs> yes. Let us consider the set A, okay, to see that it satisfies this condition. In which of the following sets? Let us consider the set A first. 
for every pair of distinct elements of the set. I don't think this is un hard to understand, yes? So, how many, what is the cardinality of set A? Three. So, how many pair of elements can I imagine in my head for this set? No? How many pair? No, more than one pair. Three pairs, yes? Of course, if you said six, that's correct because pro probably you are keeping an order for them. Yes? No, I'm not keeping the order. How many pair of elements I have? You are right. In principle, for each pair that I choose, I can arrange them this one first, this one second, or the other way around. But that's not what I mean when I talk about pair here. Okay? Otherwise, in mathematics, I should emphasize the ordered pair. Yes? If I really want you to keep the order, which sometimes I do, then I will tell you ordered pairs, not just pair. Yes? Okay. So, how many, how many elements are there? three elements how many pair of elements you can consider three so let us write them down for set a one pair that i can consider is this pair one of them is b the other one is curly b this is one of the pairs of elements that i can consider from the elements of this understandable let us consider another pair another pair is curly b and which pair, which one curly curly b do you agree? This is another pair that I can imagine for this set. Is there any other pair that I can imagine? Uh, B yes, B and curly, curly B. Yes? So this is how I myself interpret the first sentence. In which of the following sets, if any, for every pair of distinct elements. I'm considering set A. I have considered all possible pair of elements that I have. I can write. Then I am asking. One of the sets, one of the sets, yes, elements of the set, one set in the pair is an element of the other. Okay, so let us go here. This is one pair. Is it true that one element in the pair is an element of the other? Yes or no? Which one is element of the other? This is small b is an element of curly b. So, for the time being, this satisfies the condition. Let us go to the other pair. Is it true that one of them is an element of the other? It's also true, because this one is an element of this one. Let us go to the third pair. Is it true that one of them is an element of the other one? No. no. Because B does not belong to the second one, and clearly the second one does not belong to the first one either. Yes? So, this sentence is not true for set A. Is that understandable? Now, do you think that's a good translation or not? Understandable now? Yes? So, yeah. Of course. So, so let me just... This is correct. This is correct. Let me cross this over. I already... Uh, okay. Now tell me which one, if any, has this property when you understand what's going on. Okay, do you think that set B satisfies this condition? No. Yes? Why not? Because how many pairs, again, I can imagine for set B? Three. One of them is A and curly A. And then the other one is A and A and B. The other one is this one. Yes? These are the pairs, all the possible pairs that I can construct using the elements in the set B. Okay, here, this belongs to this. That's true. Okay, good. This one belongs to this one. That's also true. But what about this one? Neither this one belongs to that, nor the other way around. Do you agree? So again, the third one does not work, so we throw B away. And it is clear. How many pair of elements can I construct for C? Only one pair. And that's clear, yes? The pair is uh, curly brackets and 
curly brackets one and two. Okay. So do you think that this satisfies this condition? No problems. No problems. This can happen for everyone. Okay. So what happens here? Do you think that curly brackets belong to that one? No. The other way around? No, actually that was very simple. Okay. But do you think D? So this is also not true. Let us go to D. How many pair of elements I can construct here again? Three. One of them is A and curly A, one of them is A and curly A and curly A, and the other one is curly A, curly A, curly A, curly A. I don't know this. Let us check. Is it true that one of them is the element of the other? Yes, which one? This little A is an element of this one. Is it true that one of them is an element of the other? Again, true. Is it true that one of them is the element of the other? It's true. So all of them are true. So we choose. Yes? Is that understandable now? Yes. Good. Okay, so let us uh, review something a little bit before going further. So do you remember what was the empty set? Yes, yes what was the empty set? Yes? A set without any elements. Without containing any elements, yes? And then uh, what uh, was the universal set? So what was the symbol what we use for the empty set? Do you remember? It was something like that. Yes? I was always thinking that this is the Greek letter phi. But I think according to the book, you can translate it for me, by the way. So uh, is it here? Or? Yes. So what is that from the Norska, Norska alphabet? So what is the meaning on page 30? Ah, it's Norwegian, yes. Okay, might be. So I was always thinking that this is a Greek letter phi. Yes, you have seen it in physics probably. Yes. Uh, so uh, according to the book, this is a Norwegian alphabet. Okay. Anyway, so that's the symbol that we use for the MT set. Is this, sometimes confused, is this the MT set? No. Yes, no. This is a, a set. What is the cardinality of this set? One. What's the cardinality of this set? So they are not the same. So you understand that they are not the same. So if you want to compare, this is the empty bag. This is the bag that contains an empty bag. Yes, so they are not the same. Is that understandable? Okay. Now, Okay, let me be, become a little bit philosophical a little bit, okay? So, uh, have you, if you remember, for example, I could give you a set like this and I ask you, okay, X, and then I tell you, for example, X belongs to the set of natural numbers. Let us stick again to the same idea that then it starts from one, okay? And, uh, for example, I would say that X uh, 2 minus 4 is equal to 0. Okay, so you see what I am doing here. I am saying that the set A contains elements that I call them X with some property for X that I define later. Yes, is that understandable? So if I ask you, can you list the elements in this set, what do you say? How many elements are there? Only one. Because there are two roots for x2 equals to 4, plus and minus 2, but minus 2 does not belong to, and I have to satisfy both conditions, yes? So it means that this would be 2. Okay. So, George Contour, actually, German mathematician, actually is the progenitor, uh, the inventor, actually, I don't know the person who actually based set theory, okay? He, he was thinking that might be everything like this is a set. This is a little bit philosophical, but it's very important to understand that. So he said that, okay, let us write a curly brackets X and then such that a property of X. Yes, a property of X. And he, wasn't, he was not very explicit about what type 
of formulas you can put here. Sorry. Okay, so he said that you see the structure. The structure is a curly bracket containing an element x. And then after this such that, I am telling something, some story about x. So that's a property of x that is coming after that. And then all those elements that satisfies these properties would be an element of the set. Otherwise, they are not elements of the set. Yes? So George Cantor actually was a great mathematician. And he said that, okay, let us think about this. Because usually in mathematics, they were still struggling to define a set somehow. So he said that, let us do it like this. I open a curly bracket, I put an x, and then I would write such that, and I write a property of x. And he was not that explicit about what type of formulas that you can use for uh, properties of x. This is an optional thing, don't worry, just try to enjoy it. Okay? So, uh, so he was not explicit about what we can put here. So, so far, everything was good. This, I want you to understand what is the meaning when mathematics actually starts collapsing. And then Bertrand Russell, a genius actually, it's better to call him uh, Bertrand Russell. I, let me uh, spell the name. Bertrand Russell with double S double L. Bertrand, yes. Okay. Uh, I would say that this guy is actually a British polymath, not just mathematician, yes. And he was very, so he gave a very simple example that let, let us see what happens now. He said that you are, you are not specific about what we can represent for P of X. So according to contour, according to contour, this Okay, let me ask you this question. According to contour, this should be a set. Yes? Because contour said that you open a curly bracket and you present an element and such that with some property for x. Yes? And he was not careful enough to tell you what type of things are allowed to put here for x and what type of formulas are not allowed. And then... Bertrand Russell actually came up with this idea. He said that if you want to do something like that, then according to contour, this might be okay to call it a set. Because this is read in this way. The set containing of elements, all elements such that that element does not belong to itself. Yes? So, so Bertrand Russell actually using this formula for P of X. Are you following or not? Okay? And now... He realized that then we will, mathematics will face a very big trouble now. Why is that? Because let us talk about the set A itself. Let us see what happens. Okay? The set A belongs to A. The set A does not belong to A. These are the only properties that ha can happen because one of them is a statement the other one is its negation. Either this one should be true or this one should be true. Okay, but now it's a little bit, might be in the first time, hard to understand. But tell me, what is the consequence of A belongs to A? Just see what is the definition of A. And tell me, A belongs to A implies something for you. Can you tell me what? It's not, it's... This is the genius of Russell. Actually, this example is so handy. It was actually very simple. You don't need to be thinking very hard to come up with a very, very hard example. This is probably the nicest thing that Burton Russell actually worked. And this is called Russell Paradox. Okay? But can you tell me? You see, I have, in, I have just described you a set like this. If contour is right, and we don't need to be careful about what we put for P of X. If we are not obliged to be careful, I can just write this for P of X. And that, let us see what happens for the set A itself. There are two possibilities for the set A itself. Either it's an element of itself or not. Do you agree? This is the logic. Now let us explore. 
if A belongs to A, what is the logical consequence of assuming that A belongs to A? It doesn't belong to A. A doesn't belong to itself. Yes? Because when you say A belongs to A, it means it satisfies this criterion to be in A. Otherwise, it is not in A. Is that understandable? Because when you say A belongs to A, it should satisfy the properties for the elements in A to be in A. Otherwise, it is not in A. Is that understandable? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. yes? So when A belongs to A, it means that this A should satisfy the property of elements of the set A, which means A shouldn't belong to itself. Yes? So if you assume that A belongs to itself, the illogical consequence is that A does not belong to itself simultaneously. It's a consequence of that. Okay, let us look at the other one. A does not belong to itself. Then it satisfies the property of being in A. So it will be in A. Yes? Yes, is, is that understandable? You need to think a little bit. It's not hard. It's a logic. So I put all those elements in A that does not belong to themselves. So as soon as I find a set which does not belong to itself, I take it and put it in the bag A. Okay? Now I see that A is a set which does not belong to A, so I take it and put it in the bag A. So it means that this is in A. So if you assume A is not in A, you also have to assume, sorry, if you assume that A is not to A, belongs to A, you have to admit simultaneously A also belongs to A. And the other way around. And that's a paradox. Mathematics is really sensitive to this kind of paradoxes. If you find one of these kinds of paradoxes, all the structure will collapse immediately, no doubt. Okay? Is that understandable? So at least Russell, this is called, this is very famous, Russell, Russell paradox. So he showed that this is not the case. We have to be very careful about what we want to put here. Because if you give me the total freedom, put everything here that I want to, I will immediately uh, get this paradox. Okay? And then, of course, mathematicians realize that this is a serious problem for mathematics. Then they have started to uh, putting very firm and cl clear axioms that we have to follow. Okay? So here, if you don't put any axioms, then you will have this problem. So you need to somehow put your postulates, your axiom in a way so that this is ruled out, okay? Otherwise, we will be in trouble. Okay, so then uh, Zermelo actually, so we have set theory Zermelo, I don't remember where they are from, Frankel. They actually started axiomatizing the set theory to put it in a very firm ground, okay? And then suddenly, unfortunately, Kurt Goodell came in, he was a genius, and actually show the very famous theorem <laughs> that we will never ever be sure that we don't have any contradiction lurking for us in set theory. So this contradiction, I don't know, because of the genius of Bertrand Russell, was revealed immediately <laughs> when he started talking about set theory in this very loose way. Yes? But these people have actually axiomatized that in a very, very strong way. And apparently, so far, we couldn't find any contradictions. But unfortunately, Kurt Gödel showed a theorem, proved that, a very, 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 very nice and philosophical, actually, theorem that we will never, ever be able to make sure that there would be no contradictions in the future. <laughs> so, yeah, it might happen at always. So you need to work with the fear that someday there would be a contradiction in the set theory. Okay, so what we can do, uh, we can do two things. We can just go forward and be happy to see when we discover this contradiction or something. Or we can do better. We, can, we cannot trust something, but we can say that if these axioms are true, let us explore the consequences. So this, math, this is the way that usually mathematics goes. Okay, of course, if you find some contradiction in the set of assumptions here, everything after that will collapse but probably it will not affect other areas of mathematics which are not based on those assumptions. Yes? So, and unfortunately, this is the way it is. Okay. 
Anyway, so at least you have a feeling what is a paradox. It is not something coming from Mars or something. It's just a very, very simple example. Shows that if you want to be loose, if you, if you want, if you just don't care about very much details, then you will face a very big problem. Yes? Okay. It's good to know in, in the side. Okay, let us continue now. Any questions regarding this? Yeah, I would recommend you to go home and try to understand this a little bit. It's very, very simple. Uh, but yeah, I think the first time you need to uh, delve a little bit into it. Okay, now let us uh, talk about another very, very important concept, uh, of course, very simple in set theory, and that is the notion of being a subset. But before that, I already talked, told you what do I mean by equal sets. Can one of you define it for me? If I have capital A and capital B as two sets, when do you think I am allowed to say that these two sets are equal? Any one of you? Yes, what's your name? Zinra. Zinra, yes. So if we have two sets, set A and set B, whatever elements are in set A has to be found in set B, and whatever elements are in set B has, has to be found in set A. Yes. Do you feel that both of them is necessary or one statement is necessary? Yes. It's not. Yes. Because you might have Kelly brackets one and you might have Kelly brackets one and two. Everything in Kelly bracket, the first one is inside the other one, but not the other way around. So they are not equal. So this means that we can understand. So what are the consequences of this? This definition, there were two consequences of this definition immediately. So the notion of order for a set the order of elements is not important. So if, even if you change the order, still the elements are the same. And if you repeat an element, that's also the same. So this is why when I want to write a set, I don't care about the orders. And I do not repeat an element more than once. Yes? Is that understandable? So these are the immediate consequences of that. Now, we want to define a new very important concept in the set theory. And that is the... Uh, that is the notion of a subset okay let me write formal definition here for you a set a uh, is said to be so let me underline this this is the article a but this is I mean a set a a set a is said to be a subset of a set B if every element of A is an element of B. Not the vice versa. It's only one side. A, subset, a set A, I have two sets. One of them is capital A, the other one is capital B. I say that A is a subset of B if whatever is an element of A is also an element of B. That's it, not the other way around. Okay? To show that A is a subset of B, we write this is the symbol we use, A something like this and then we put an equality and then b the reason that i put an equality i think this is now universally adopted in older books you see just this yes but i think i will tell you why we put this uh, under it as well so this is the symbol that we use to show that a set a set a is a subset of What, what is the meaning of this statement? This, by the way, this is a statement, yes? I have two sets. This is claiming something. It's claiming that the set A 
is a subset of set B. It means that if you go and look inside this bag of A, whatever you see there as elements, you can find the same things in B. Yes? So that's this. So if you want to write it in a more formal language, which you don't need to learn, but if you like, that's good. You say that for all X, so you say that, you say that A subset of B means, means in mathematics is double-sided arrow, means equivalent, means for every X, this means for all or for every X, if X belongs to A, you can immediately conclude that X belongs to B as well. So if you want, that's good to write some word. That's the formal way of defining mathematics without words. Yes? Um, if two sets are equal, can you call them subsets? Yeah. Each other? And that's exactly. And this is one special case. And this is why we, some, we put this meaning equality, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Good, thank you. So, example, uh, so example, and let me just, don't write words to save some time. If I have the set A equals to 1 and 2, and if I have a set B, uh, 2, 3, 5, 1, square root of 3, then it's clear that A is a subset of B. Yes? A is a subset of B. Why? Because whatever is in A, whatever is an element of A, is also an element of B. So, what are the elements of A? Two elements. One belongs to A. Does one belong to B as well? Yes, yes here. The second element is two. 2 belongs to B as well, so I am done. I don't need to care about the other direction. Okay? So, this one is true. What do you think about this one? It's false. Yes? Is it possible both of them to be true when? If they are the same. If they are equal, then both of them would be true. And so it means that uh, I hope that you understand. It's very simple. So you can say that A is equal to B. Another way of defining this, it is equivalent to saying that A is a subset of B and simultaneously B is a subset of A. So some mathematics books actually define equality after defining subset. So they first define what is the meaning of a subset. And then after that, they say that we say two sets are equal if both of them are simultaneously correct. That's also another way of defining actually equality. Yes? Is that understandable? Yes. So this is why I reserve this symbol as it is in the book without this equality if they are subsets and they are not equal. Okay? So that's called a proper subset. So here, A is a subset of B. That's clear. But A is not equal to B. So if I want to emphasize that, instead of writing this, I would write A is a B. So it means that if you see this symbol, it means that whatever is in A is in B, because A is a subset of B, and because I have taken this line away, it means that A and B are not equal in that symbol. Yes, because when you write a subset, it might be that they are equal. But if I want to emphasize that they are not equal, okay, I will take away this horizontal line. Okay, and then there is an, another name, if you want to know, that is called a proper subset of B. Okay, so let me write it in this way. Let me write, if A is a subset of B and A is not equal to B, then... Uh, a is called a proper subset of A. Oh, sorry, a proper subset of uh, B. These 
are the terminologies that you need to know. These are just names. Is that understandable? Yes. Okay. Uh, now, because you know that usually our brains, I don't know, because of evolution theory, whatever, we have evolved in a way that probably we're a little bit more comfortable with pictures and figures rather than abstract notions, yes? So you remember, for example, in, I don't know, in matrice or whatever, when you talk, for example, about a function, there is a pictorial way to imagine a function, and that's the graph of a function, yes? By looking at the graph of the function, immediately you can understand a lot of properties of the function, but if you want to do them analytically, you need to do a lot of work. So having a pictorial representation of an abstract concept is really useful for our brains, okay? And this is also the case here. This is called a Venn diagram, yes? A Venn diagram is actually a pictorial way to represent things about set theory so that we can visualize them and be more comfortable. For example, and this, there are some uh, there are some very simple rules. So when you want to, so Venn diagram, a Venn diagram, uh, so if you remember I told you that whenever I want to talk about a set theory, I have to clarify first what is my universal set. The same is true here. The universal set by convention is represented by a fairly bigger rectangle. So this is the universal set. Okay, so if I want to draw a Venn diagram, I have to draw a rectangle telling that, okay, this is my universal set. Okay, do you think now something like that intuitively, do you think that I can draw this and call it set A? No, because some part of A is outside the universal set, but because of the definition of the universal set, this is not possible. So then it means that if you want to draw, you have a lot of freedom how to draw and visualize. You don't need to be very careful about the shape. Usually, you draw them as circles or, I don't know, ellipses or whatever you like, but it should be included in the interior of this rectangle. For example, I can just draw something here for A, and then I can, I don't know, even I can do this something like this, even though we usually don't do that, I can call it set B, and whatever I want to draw, it should be exactly, uh, entirely inside this rectangle, yes? Okay, for example, let us represent this relation by Venn diagram. So, do you think this is a good representation for showing that A is a subset of B? No, because there are some parts of A that are not in B. So that's not a good representation of showing A is a subset of B. So it's a very intuitive tool. So if I want to uh, show that A is indeed a subset of B, I might draw this diagram. For example, I will draw a little bit bigger uh, B, and then if I want to show A is a subset of B, I respect and draw A inside, yes? And then this is a good representation that A is a subset of B. Why? Because whatever I see in A, it's already in B as well. Is this, in this case, is B a subset of A? No, because there are some parts of B which are not included in A, so B is not a subset of A. Is that understandable? So that's the notion of Venn diagram, as simple as that. But it's a very, very important tool in your hand. You will see that. Okay, let me ask you one question. And I just want you to tell, because uh, if I say that, how do you translate this? So, how do you translate this? A is not... Please think and then answer, okay? Don't spoil the, uh, the joy of the question, yes? So, A is not a subset of V. It means... Yes? B is a subset of A? No. So let us, let us criticize, let us have a critic on that. So is that right or not? He said that when we say A is not a set of B, this is a, by the way, this is a very important concept. I will tell you why. Because we are, no, we are losing the notion of total order. I will talk about that. By the way, what we are doing now, do you remember, we defined, a, let me just repeat this again, we defined a notion of set. If I just stop there, it's completely useless. Okay, this is set. What then what? So I need to do, I need to be able to do something with the set. So I need to combine them somehow. I don't know. In, in arithmetic, we add numbers. 
subtract them, multiply them. So we need to have an operation between them. So we need to set up algebra of sets. So we need to define some kind of operations between them so that this concept becomes useful for us. Okay? Uh, so then it would be good to take some lessons from the very simple notion of numbers. Yes, have something in mind to see that we, how we combine numbers. Can I, can I take some lessons to understand how to combine sets? But of course, num if one, one, two are just one single numbers. But usually when we talk about sets, it includes a lot of probably numbers. Yes. So the, the operations should be totally different. So we need to learn how, what we can do with sets that are probably useful. Okay. Think, have this in your, the back of your head. Okay. But now A is not a subset of B. It doesn't mean that B is a subset of A. Yes. If you say, if I have two numbers that are not equal, either, one, either the first one is smaller than the second one. If this is not, then definitely the second one is smaller than the first one. Might be this was in the back of your head, comparing this with numbers. But for the set theory, it's not true. Can you give me an example of two sets? Neither is a subset of the other one. Yes? As simple as possible. A is a set of one. One. And B is a set of two. Exactly. Is A a subset of B? No. Is B a subset of A? No. They are equal? No. But in numbers, if I have two numbers which are not equal, either the first one is a smaller than the second one, or definitely the second one is a smaller than the first one. But that kind of relation is not working for sets. Okay, so that's not the meaning of A is not a subset of B. When you say that A is not a subset of B, what does it mean? Anyone else? Yes, your name again? I, I will ask you till April, okay? Yes, what's your name? Ilma. Ilma, yes? Irma or Ilma? Ilma. Ilma, okay? No, think a little bit. You were very, very, it starts very nice. Yeah, A is not a subset of B. What does it mean? There exists. That's completely right. No, no, you know. Because this is not something you say you don't know. I want... <laughs> Because I want to tell you this is completely logic. And logic is you don't need a teacher. Every human is following the same logic. Yes? You can complete it. A is not a subset of B. When you say A is a subset of B, it means everything in A is already in B. So when you say A is not a subset of B, means there exists... There exists. Yeah, whatever you want, say whatever you want to. Um, it doesn't like, exist in B. I don't know. Okay, but what was the first statement? Yes, that's correct. There exists what? Uh, yes, there exists. Can you complete it? None of the elements in A. No, 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 no. Be careful. Yeah, that was the correct one. This is a matter of confusion. You say none of them. That's not the correct. This, this, the correct phrase is there exists, not there doesn't exist at all. There exists and there does not exist are two different things. That's very important. Okay? So, this, can someone complete it? Com yes? There exists some elements in A that are not found in B. Exactly. There exists something in A which is not in B. That's the meaning. When you say that, you see, it's trivial. You so I I don't know so you so you have a bug in your logic yes you don't have a bug in your program you need to reprogram yourself okay but uh, a is not a subset of b means what I found something in a which is not in b it doesn't mean there exists uh, who said there exists there doesn't exist you said so you don't need to say that nothing in A is in not is in B or whatever. Only one phrase. There exists something in A which is not in B. Yes? That is the meaning of 
being a, not a subset, yes? Can there, be a, can there be a possibility when A it doesn't exist anything in A? Yes. Okay. But we will see that this does not happen because the end, by the way, that's also a very important question. I will come to it. Okay? You are right. You are right. But uh, this is also, I want you to understand exactly this, then I will go to your question. Because the answering your question needs understanding this. Okay? So, can you translate this for me? I really want you to use, these are called logical quantifiers. Logical quantifiers, one of them is this upside down A for all. And then this is the other, this one. This means there exists. Okay? These are the only independent ones. Of course, you might see in the literature that some people use this. And some people use this. I give you some names, but don't worry, these are not in the book, but I, this is something I want you to know. This is called universal quantifier for all. This is called existential quantifier. And this is not only existential, this exclamation mark means that there exists one and only one. Okay? But when you say there exists, this you can say there exists at least one. So when you say there exists, it means that at least you have one thing that works. But when you write this, it means that you have one and only one. Okay? This is non-existential, uh, actually, quantifier. It means that there is no. Okay? This means there is a unique. This means there is no. It's good to see these symbols. I will use them a lot. Please re remember them. Even though they are not in the book, you don't need to write them in the exam, but I will use them here. Okay. So, let us translate this again. Let us go back. A is a subset of B. This is equivalent to saying that for all X, if X belongs to the left-hand side, then X belongs to the right-hand side. This is the meaning of A being a subset of B. Now, I want you to use these symbols to translate what, what you said in English into mathematical symbols. Okay, now can you tell me what should I write here? So what was the sentence? There exists an element in A which is not in B. Yes, that is the meaning. So how should I tra translate it? Instead of ex a universal quantifier, I use the existential quantifier. Yes? And such that what? Yes? X doesn't belong to B. What should I put here? And. and. Very good. Very good. Thank you. So is that understandable? So A does not belong to B means I found something which is in A, but it is not in B or something like that. Is that understandable? So if you think it's completely natural coming out of it, as Elia said. Okay. So this is something that I want you to know. Even though if you don't like, this is not obligatory to know the symbols. But in the book, it is obligatory to understand. If you want, if I ask you to write it in English, you should be able to write it in English. If you don't like to use these symbols. Yes? Okay. And now, one uh, question is that. I will tell this one and then I go back to what Dylan said. Which is very important actually. And it's a little bit confusing. This is a very E-level question. I give you a set and I ask you to write all possible subsets of the set. It's a very simple exercise. It's an E-level question in the book, I don't know. So you, can, you should know this. For example, let me, let me not start from the empty set. Okay, we we'll come back to it. So let me start with this set. I ask you to write all possible subsets of this set and list them, okay? So I write it with blue. So what, so what is the first, what is the subsets, what are the subsets of this set? Yes? Uh, is it one and the empty set? Yes. Okay, so how did you know that the empty set? So my, this is clear, 
Do you agree that this is a subset of this? Yes. Why? Because whatever is in here, it's also here. So that's a subset, even though they are exactly equal, but that's also a subset. But actually, Amanda said the empty set is also should be in your list. This I want you to ask. Why? Okay, so let us be clear. It's very important. It's proof by contradiction. Okay, I want to teach you this. It's also, you don't need a teacher to teach you that unless you have a bug in your system, okay? But otherwise, you will understand it quite well. My claim, I'm just claiming that, empty set is, the subset, is a subset of A. This is my claim. I want to claim this statement is true. Okay, how can I uh, show that? I claim and I believe in that. You say, no, I don't believe in that. So you have to believe in what? Either you should believe in this statement or its negation. Because either the statement is true or its negation is true. Yes? So if you, come, if you agree with my claim, we are done, we are friends, goodbye. That's it. If you don't, so it means that you have to believe the opposite of it. Yes? So if not... If not, then, what does it mean? If not, then, tell me. I want to write something. The empty set is not sub a subset of A. Is that right? If you don't believe in this, you have to believe in that. Yes? Okay. But now, what is the consequence of this statement? I will come to you. This statement tells you that if A is not a subset of B, what is the meaning of that? It means that I could find something in A which is not in B. Is that understandable? So if you don't believe in that, the immediate consequence is that you have to believe in that. Okay? And then, according to what we came up with, this means that, therefore, there exists an element in the empty set that is not in A. And that's your contradiction. So if you don't believe what I said, you have to believe in that, and then you have to believe that you were able to find something in the empty set which is not in the A. But that's contradiction because the empty set, by definition, doesn't have any elements. So this is, this is a very uh, important thing to understand. You see, there is no other way that I know about proving this. This proof is called the proof by contradiction, okay, or proof by contrapositive. So I say that, we will talk about this systematically a little bit later in the course, but it is good to understand that these things are just following your own logic. It's not something that I have to teach you. So if you don't believe in that, you have to believe in this. And if you believe in this, you come to a statement which, is, which contradicts what we already agreed on. We already agreed on the empty set by its definition is containing nothing but now you have to simultaneously admit that I found something there which doesn't work so it means that what is what is the consequence uh, the empty set exactly with this kind of reasoning is the opposite of every set because that's the same thing there is nothing particular about this A in this reasoning when I am doing I don't care what are the elements of A A could be any set do you agree so that's the very thing. I will, assist, I will write them formally probably next time, but I just want you to understand that. So, one thing that you learn is that the empty set is, the sub, is a subset of all sets. This is a, always in your list. There is another set which is always in your list, and that is? Universe. What? Universe. No, no, no. Be careful. I am, this is a subset of the universal set. This question asks you to write subsets of this set. Yes? The set itself. The set itself. So remember, when I give you a set 
and I ask you to write all subsets of that set, two of them are already determined. One of them is the empty set, the other one is the set itself. And you don't need to tell me why. Okay, you just write the empty set is the smallest one, and the largest one is the set itself. Might be we have something in between. In this case, do we have something in between? No, no I have only two in my list. Okay, let me, uh, let me write here. Let me go to another situation. Okay. So I go to the other situation. So I have another set. Let me call it B. Let me put two elements there. This time let me use, let me use all the time numbers here. One and two. Okay. Uh, might be it's a good idea to do not separate them by commas. Might be it's a good idea to write them vertically below each other. Understanding that I am answering two things. So you can say that one of them is this one. The second one is this one. Okay. Let us do it here. Okay. What is the first one? Don't think. What's the first one? The empty set. Okay. What is the second one? The set, a single tone containing only one. That's it. Is there any other one? Is there any other singleton? Yes. And what would be the last one? The set itself. So how many? Four. In that case, how many? Two. Yes. For the fourth one, could you write just B? If it's a really yeah, long yes, set. Yes. Yes. If I have given you the name, you can write B itself. Yes. Is that understandable? Let us do something for a three element set. C, let me just write one, two, or three. Okay? So, what is the first in my list? The MT set, yes? The second one is, for example, I cannot say the second one. If you want, of course, it's better to keep the order, but the order doesn't matter. You can start with the single tone of two. That's okay. The next one is one, uh, sorry, the next one is two. Single tone containing only two. And the other one is this one. Are there more? For example, what? One and two. One and three. Two and three. Yes. Do I need to write two and one as well? I wrote one and two. Should I write two and one? No, because they are the same. You shouldn't repeat them. So, and the last one is? The set itself. So this is an E-level question, which is really you need to know. I give you a set, you have to write there, uh, be able to write the subsets. But if I ask you write the proper subsets of this, where do you stop? Yes? Before, uh, before the last one. You just exclude the last one. Because that's the meaning of being a proper subset. That's just a definition. Yes? Okay. And now, let me go back and put the empty set here on my list above. So what would be the subset of the empty set, by the way? Because you know I started with a single tone and then I increased the element, so you know how to do it. Of course, it would be a little bit mess if I go to the fourth one, yes? But if I start with A, which is the empty set, how many elements do I, how many subsets do I have for the empty set? How many? One. one. That is? Beta. The empty set. Yes, nothing more. So the empty set is the only set in my list. Okay, later when we go to combinatorics, we find the formula for the number of subsets. Okay, but then you can have a pattern here. Do you see the pattern? How many subsets do I have? Yes? Uh, n factorial plus 2. No, no. Factorial is something that you haven't studied systematically, so I will not ask if, if that's the answer. No, just look. How many elements are in this one? Zero. How many subsets I have? One. How many elements are there? One. How many subsets I have? Two. Here I have two elements. How many subsets? Four. Three elements. How many subsets? Eight. So what do you guess if I go to four element set? Do you have a formula? Do you see the pattern? What? 16. 16. What's the pattern? 2 to, the power. 2 to the power of the elements of the set. Yes? 
The cardinality of this is 0. 2 to power 0 is 1. I have only 1. The cardinality of this is 1. 2 to power 1 is 2. The cardinality of this is 2. 2 to power 2 is 4. The cardinality of this is 3. 2 to power 3 is 8. Yes? I just have a question for the empty. Yes? And does that mean there are no proper subsets for that? Exactly. I cannot ask write proper subsets for the empties. Yes, so is that understandable? So let me just write this remark, but the proof will come later when we study the next chapter, okay? So, important remark. Remember this. Uh, let A be a, subset, be a set, be a finite set, then the number, this means the number of subsets of A is equal to 2 to the power of cardinality of A. Yeah, so that's a very important remark. I, I will feel free to use it even though I haven't shown the proof to you yet. But feel free to use it until we see the proof next uh, chapter. When the lesson ends? Uh, at 10. Okay, so but we have a test after. Uh, okay, oh, you mean that you want to finish it now? English. Internet. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we can we can stop here. So I don't want to give you stress for your exam. Okay? Uh, okay. I haven't finished with the uh, subset yet. I will continue. Of course, in the page, it's just half a page. But all of them are actually at the level of your understanding. They are not hard, except some of the few things that I every now and then tell you, okay? And you don't need to learn them if you don't like to, okay? Uh, so, if you don't have any questions, let us end the meeting here, and then we continue next time, okay? This, this afternoon, no, this evening, I will try to update. Uh, by the way, I set up a test. I'm just, I don't know, please check. It, is, it shows that you are not che checking, yes? Please check. What I write on the uh, Google Classroom, so I, ju I just trying to learn how to use the Google Form feature for correct automatically correcting your uh, multiple choice questions. So I want to see how it works. Okay, and that's a good idea to give you some questions to evaluate yourself because immediately you can see your grade and immediately you see which questions you answer correctly and which one wrong. Yes. Uh, okay, no questions. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.